Hi, welcome aboard. This is a fairly unusual environment for us. I'm sitting in the right-hand seat of a DC-3 about 30 miles south of Princess Charlotte Bay on our way via Air Queensland to the Wilderness Lodge on the tip of Cape York. The old DC-3 is a superb old aeroplane and it's 30 years since I've sat in the right-hand seat of one of these, so it's a, it's a visit back to the past for me. We're cruising at 120 knots at 6,500 feet and we've got about another three hours of flying time before we reach Barmaga, which is the airport for, for uh, the Wilderness Lodge. Now, the skipper, Des White, has been kind enough to let me uh, fly right seat. And we'll be showing you not only the Wilderness Lodge, which is about 100 metres south of the very tip, northern tip of Australia on Cape York, but some of the activities, some of the fishing and some of the superb countryside in one of our most remote, but one of our most historical and interesting areas. Higgins Field was a staging airfield for aircraft moving into the Pacific Theatre during the closing stages of World War II. It serves Bamaga and the surrounding areas and was the scene of a tragic crash on the 4th of May 1945. This DC-3, flown by an ANA pilot and manned by US Army personnel, was landing at 5am after a courier flight from Archerfield in Brisbane when it struck trees at the end of the runway and crashed with the loss of all on board. It now stands as a shrine to the airmen of both countries who fought so valiantly in the Pacific campaign. Bamaga is the northernmost settlement on the Australian mainland and has a population of 2,000, 200 of whom are European. It's a thriving community with cattle, bananas, fishing and sawmilling being among the main industries. The wharf is a popular place with the kids and they manage to extract a maximum amount of fun from catching bait fish along with the occasional large trevally. The trip from Bamaga to the Wilderness Lodge is by four-wheel drive and is exciting. Speeds of up to 80 kilometres per hour are necessary to minimise the effects of the corrugations. The countryside varies from open bush to monsoon forest and because of careful maintenance by the lodge is passable all year round. The lodge is an oasis in the forest with the lush greenery being maintained through the dry by constant care and watering by the staff. A cool drink is waiting whilst the staff unload the luggage and most guests make straight for their first look at the northern tip of Australia as soon as they've checked in. The lodge has an interesting history. In 1978, Sir Sidney Williams of Bush Pilot Airways, now Air Queensland, leased 600 acres of the very tip of Australia. Sid, along with Paul Phelan, the current manager, laid their plans for the lodge well. They built a number of these billy huts to test the feasibility of various types of dwellings for the area and spent several years developing the site and varying and modifying the layout of the lodges. The experience thus gained paid off and they commenced construction in earnest at the beginning of the 1985 wet season, with the resort being opened officially by the Premier Sir Joe Bielke peterson in May 1986. There are six cabins incorporating four lodges with accommodation for three people in each. The prevailing southeasterly breeze is used with a shutter controlled through flow ventilation system supplemented by ceiling fans affording comfort regardless of the outside temperature. Guests can cool off in the swimming pool and the dining area along with the rest of the resort is beautifully integrated with the surroundings. There are no strangers here, just friends you haven't met. 
and the staff, whilst catering to every whim, manage to make it appear so effortless that it becomes difficult to distinguish staff from guests. Each one is an expert on some aspect of the wilderness and their love for the area is obvious and catching. The Cape York Wilderness Lodge nestles between the very first mountain of the Great Dividing Range and the rocky promontory that's the northern tip of Australia. Vegetation in the area varies from open tropical savanna to monsoon forest. This is a variation of rainforest with the advantage of a lack of dense ground cover making it possible to walk comfortably through it. Palms, orchids, lianas and vines abound and form a habitat for a vast variety of wildlife. The canopy is home to indigenous and migratory birds including many species from New Guinea only 120 kilometres across Torres Strait. Cockatoos, honey eaters and fig birds flash their colours through the foliage during the day whilst frogmouths, nightjars, bats and flying foxes can be seen during torch safaris during the forest at night. The trees are also home to a variety of snakes and pythons. This northern tree snake allowed himself to be caught for our camera. Found only in the far north, he is one of the many harmless species of snakes to be found in the area. Another reptile who has learned the advantages of having human habitation nearby is this old man Goanna. He's developed a predilection for cooked sausages, although I don't think he was hungry at this stage. The Goanna, or monitor lizard, is one of the hardiest reptiles in Australia and it's found all over the country. Due to his heavy body mass he is active for a large part of the day. His normal diet consists of smaller reptiles, furry animals, frogs and birds and he's a formidable fighter, acquitting himself well against his natural enemy, the dingo. The rainforest abounds with a wide variety of snakes, some of them venomous, most of them non-venomous, like this water python. This is a full-grown specimen around about two metres long, although some of the other species, such as the amethystine python, grow considerably larger. In fact, in some cases, up to 15 or 16 feet. Now, the pythons, as I said, are non-venomous. This one is very, very docile. It won't even bite. But in the case of some of the larger ones, they can inflict quite a painful bite. They have a mouthful of razor-sharp, tiny teeth. And, of course, most people's reaction, if they do get bitten, is to pull their hand away. And, of course, that tears the flesh. So don't... Uh, don't handle them. Uh, most people find it difficult to identify the various species of snake. So don't simply walk up to a snake and grab it uh, in the belief that it's non-venomous. This is also called the rainbow snake. And if you look at the patina on the scales of the snake in the sun there, it, they, they fluoresce in quite magnificent colours. In fact, all the colours of the rainbow. And the Aborigines have a legend that the rainbow python is the source of all life on Earth, including human life. So uh, uh, another example of the magnificent wildlife that you can actually come in contact and see in its wild state up close when you visit the northern tip of Australia. For the boating and fishing man, Cape York is a paradise. The white sweep of Evans Bay on the eastern shore is a perfect location for taking advantage of the steady southeasterly breeze for a spot of catamaran sailing. The fishing is excellent and the lodge provides tinnies for the use of guests. Gary Wright, famous North Queensland fishing guide, is based at the Wilderness Lodge and conducts one-day fishing expeditions to the Jardine River and Jackie Jackie Inlet near Bamaga. Principal species caught on these trips is barramundi, with fish up to 10 kilograms being common. A trip along Crocodile Creek to the west of Frangipani Beach on the western shore will often reveal the crocodile basking in the sun and a magnificent vista of tropical mangroves. This is the habitat of many of the most important and unique species in the area, including crabs, mudskippers and many varieties of wading birds. Saltwater crocodiles abound and can be found up to 16 foot long. They're well camouflaged, agile and extremely dangerous, often being seen well to sea but with caution and common sense, the beaches can be enjoyed. 
Swimming or even paddling in the creeks and billabongs, however, is a very dangerous undertaking. Controversy rages over crocodiles and the way in which current society relates to them, particularly in Australia. On the one hand, we have the, the conservationists who believe that man should move out of crocodile inhabited areas and leave them completely for crocodiles. On the other hand, we have the people who feel that crocodiles should, uh, uh, should be culled until they reach extinction. Now, in between, there has to be a moderate view and uh, the, the opinion has been put forward that farming crocodiles is a viable way of preserving and maintaining the species. And if you look at that in a little depth, you'll realise that that actually is the case. Crocodiles are an excellent uh, crop. They're a very easy animal to farm. They're easy to feed. They, use, uh, they eat uh, chicken offal, uh, things that, uh, that aren't usable in other areas. They thrive on things like that. They reach an age where they can be, uh, be culled uh, for commercial purposes. After about two years, this little fella is around about a year old. Remarkably strong, by the way, and capable of inflicting an extremely painful bite with those jaws, which are armed with very, very sharp, needle-sharp teeth. So somewhere in between the two extremes of opinion, there has to be a way by which crocodiles can be allowed to continue to live in the wild, where, in other words, we can come to terms with the fact that they are actually a, a deadly and dangerous species and where the fact that they are, have extreme commercial value, the meat is very, very, uh, is highly prized as a table meat, and of course everybody knows how the skins are used, and make sure that by farming crocodiles, by growing them under controlled circumstances and exploiting them commercially under controlled circumstances, their numbers and, uh, and their health in the wild is maintained. So uh, another aspect of, of some of the fascinating stories that you find in the far north due mainly to the fact that there is such a proliferation of various species of life form up here, the quite remarkable and ancient crocodile. The waters of Torres Strait yield a bounty of seafood typified by this painted lobster. Unique to the north, the lobster is easily spared or even grabbed by a gloved hand as he emerges from his cave in the rocks around Eberich and York Islands off the tip. If you look due north between York and Eberich Islands there, uh, in, through that little strait, you're looking effectively at the dividing line between the Pacific Ocean out to the east and the Indian Ocean to the west. Now there really isn't a dividing line, but it's nice to think that there is. Now there's a brass plaque here which gives you distances and directions for various cities and centres around the world. Now, Interestingly enough, Sydney is straight down that direction there, it's 2,720 k's and Adelaide is over that way and it's also 2,720 k's away. A couple of other distances and directions, Montreal straight out there at 14,800 k's, Thursday Island is just over behind me, it's about 29 k's away, not very far at all. Um, um, Bamaga uh, is just 27 k's down there along the, the uh, western shore of the Gulf. And it's truly fascinating to be able to sit here on the very northern tip of Australia and be able to look out in various directions and imagine not only the direction but the distance away that some of these, these centres are. Now we've had a marvellous couple of days up here. I must admit I was amazed not only at the beauty of the scenery uh, and the magnificence of the scenery, but also the wildlife and the general ecology and environment in the area is truly fascinating. And what makes it all much nicer is the fact that the lodge is so beautifully set up, so nicely integrated with its surroundings and so pleasant to stay in that you, you can be a part of the wilderness and be all in it and doing all that without really having to rough it. So it's a marvellous way to spend a week or so to come right to the northern tip of Australia to the Cape York Wilderness Lodge.